Hey everyone, welcome to Rationable. Thank you so much for joining us. Today I have a person on for an amazing interview, but someone who I have been actually been quite an admirer of. Not for a very long time because I've just recently discovered his YouTube channel and his his podcast, but this is definitely going to be a very interesting conversation. Vimo, welcome to Rationable. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Abhijit. The pleasure is all mine. I gotta say, I have, from my initial impressions, you do seem to be like, and I don't want to put you in a hole here or a box. So. No, feel free. Push me, push me. <laughs> it's okay. The Indian version of Matt Dillahunty. At least you're heading there. In a, you're heading in that direction. Yeah, I would be really happy if that were true. I don't think it is true, but I hope it becomes true one day. I've been listening to a few of your podcasts and during few of the very long drives I've been having recently and uh, the questions that you answer the clarity that you have on aspects of religion on politics are very clear and well defined so you you do seem to have a good handle on it it's religion unfortunately is something that I haven't managed to really get a grip on most of my life because I was brought up in a very liberal setting yeah that's the difference I think the reason you think I have a hold on it is because I've actually been religious not extremely religious but reasonably religious and I also had a phase where I was going through all the huge fan of Deepak Chopra and stuff and all that yeah. So I've been through all those things. So the clarity comes from experience. Exactly. And that's exactly what I want to dig into. Today. It really, I'm very curious as to where your journey began and how mm. you've explained this in a proper detail in a video. But if you could give us a sh kind of a brief version of what were the key factors that really broke down your worldview and brought you into a more rational perspective. That would be great. Okay, so before even I start, I'd like to clarify that being rational is something like rationality itself is a concept that I think everyone uses in a different way. Yeah. If someone is, if someone subscribes to a religious worldview and they have their creation myths and if their worldview, their behavior is consistent with that creation myth, then within the context of that religion, they are being rational. So yeah, when we talk about rationality, we are talking about rational thought as it is understood in modern times. But it is perfectly possible to be a rational Christian, a rational Muslim or a rational Hindu, depending on what the outer boundaries of your philosophical worldview are. Mm -hmm. Secondly, my journey into it was primarily like I was a boy brought up in a reasonably religious family and my family was I would suppose if there is a religious spectrum where on one end is extreme religious people who do everything according to religion my family my immediate family was not there they were somewhere on the middle ground they performed the rituals they took part in the festivities and that was about it mm -hmm. and I largely grew up disinterested in it but what happens to NRIs happened to me on a more local level where people move to another country and they find that all the religiosity that were that they were surrounded by is no longer there. Become twice the Hindu or three times the Muslim or something. So yeah. what happened to me was that as a adult, when I moved out of my home state and went to live in an, another city where I worked, mm -hmm. I found that I missed all of that. I had been taken for granted for a long time, but I missed all of that. So I picked up books about to feel good about my religious heritage and stuff. And that was the second phase of it. You might have called me an atheist when I was growing up, but I wasn't really. But when I was away from my hometown, I actually became somewhat more religious, somewhat more spiritual. And then from that, I got to reading books that justify religiosity in modern times, quantum shit and all that. So I got to be a huge fan of that also. Then it became part of my work. And for a number of years, I did not think about it a lot because I went into my creative field of comic book writing and all that. Nice. But again, my engagement was with mythology. So I was writing fantasy based on mythology. So the engagement was not completely absent. Then I was also like my politics also became somewhat religious. I was a right winger. I've done videos about that also if anyone wants to watch it. It's a long story on my channel. After I left that job and I moved away from it, there was never a single day when I thought, okay, now I will stop. But it fell away from me. Like I had spent almost all the mental space I could on it and it fell away. And then one day I discovered Matt Delhanty's channel, Matt Delhanty's di discussions on the atheist experience. And I was having a lot of fun. They were bashing Christians and Muslims. And in the spirit of reasonableness, I one day asked myself, does this all apply to Hinduism? And I was reasonably dispassionate at that point of time. The emotional aspects, as I mentioned, had fallen away. So I was able to make that determination that, yeah, it does apply to my religion. The kind of shit that I see over there and laugh, I should be laughing at my own also. And then I did. And then I actually started identifying as an atheist. 
and then now i'm here the journey is still ongoing by the way the yeah. journey is still ongoing there is an entire breed of people in india called hindu atheists who are right. who are who don't subscribe to any superstitions but are unwilling to let go of a religious identity and along with that comes a lot of other cultural baggage that may still keep them irrational so those are things that took some more time to fall away but i think i'm in a reasonably good place right now so i have also heard that there's a form of hinduism or there is some sort of a classification in hinduism which is an atheist classification i i have a problem with that because the thing that people usually talk about is either nirishwarvad which means religion without god mm-hmm. which is okay or people talk about charvak philosophy which is Absolutely. which was a school of materialists around 600 bc in india my problem is why would any of that be called hindu nobody was using the word hindu back then it you can call it vedic but you can't because charvaks explicitly rejected the vedas you will have to call it ancient indian materialism and that i'm okay with when contemporary hindus try to claim all of that like mm. there are hindus who say that christians are hindu and muslims are hindu and all that but you've seen this being done by people from all religions there are in a christian majority country mm. someone might say we are all children of christ it's the same sentiment it's basically picking someone up and saying you are actually like me and that person will does not have enough political power or a voice to say that no i am not like you man i don't identify as you you are you i am me let me be me you will see muslims doing this also everyone was created by allah and therefore everyone is by default muslim so people have forgotten we are reminding them and that sort of stuff so hindus do that also like you've seen the rss repeatedly say that everyone in india is hindu so what they're actually doing is that they're equating the indian identity with the hindu identity and i think that is problematic not only for historical reasons but also for political reasons because you're granting weight to the hindutva way of life which is treating hinduism as if it's some fundamental part of being indian it is not india is a diverse place even within hinduism there are so many tribes and so many religions and stuff that will not like being called hindu there are people who don't like being called hindu and we keep calling them hindu there are tribal religions which are assimilated into hinduism there are the hindu in our yeah. constitution applies to sikhs and buddhists also and there are six and buddhists who don't like it so i'm just, i just try to keep my ears open to that sort of thing and i'm not a huge fan of labeling everything hindu just because it is from india i think we already have a word for things that come from india and that word is indian that's why i call myself an indian atheist instead of a hindu atheist yeah same here actually and uh, i've grown up in a family which is more brahmo <laughs> reformist sect of hinduism and very liberal so there's no idol worship there's no statue worship the it's just it's a very pantheistic version or perspective of god we don't have to celebrate anything we don't have any fasts we don't do vegetarianism on tuesdays mm. or anything of that sort so my parents did take me to these congregations when i was a kid but i was never force fed any of that so fortunately i was allowed to make up my own mind as i went along and i was most of the time i was either atheist or agnostic mm. of course agnostic atheist is what we all are most of yeah. us are, with the exception of maybe somebody like david silverman who is a right winger now <laughs> yeah he's not where he started is all i'm saying yeah yeah he's had a journey himself but i but i remember i read sam harris's atheist manifesto mm. and by the time i finished that i was like yeah that makes sense that seems to be the way i seem to identify how i see the world basically so have you read that by any chance i've read his letter to letters to the christian nation is that the one you're talking about no this is a this is an essay called the atheist manifesto i may have back then i read a lot and i read a lot by sam harris also i may have but i don't have a clear recollection of it but it's it should be available on google and stuff my like. my journey was actually this sam harris richard dawkins and christopher hitchens brought me to the cliff matt delanty punched me in the stomach and <laughs> you all know a harari pushed me off the cliff that <laughs> I is really uh, love the way he's he he puts religion and politics and all of that across a book sapiens it's like he put something that i knew but in a completely new perspective that it's yeah. all imagination hey, the book has been accused of oversimplifying a lot of things and i appreciate that perspective also yeah but for me it was just that the, i think the only thing that was still keeping me connected to religion was that i was thinking there are some things that i can't clearly put my finger on as to how these happened and mm. it had never occurred to me to look in the direction of anthropology ah. which is just i blame it on my own personal lack of perspective but he pushed me in that direction and once i looked i found that the evolution of religion can also be at least narrated in evolutionary like we we come from we evolved together social evolution is a thing tribal unity is a thing storytelling is a thing that works for tribal unity 
and it helped me really put my thoughts in perspective but in india as an atheist and somebody who has been been on calls with huge of people twice a week and earlier apparently every day every day it was twice a week in the beginning then it got every day and then i realized i can't handle this so I, it went back to twice a week yeah exactly so i and some of these conversations that you've had were very interesting and the first part i want to ask about that is what how do people give you as an atheist like i was talking to kumar nage yesterday my previous interview which will be coming out very soon he is one of the founders of the bright society which i had told you about earlier which is mm. a maharashtra based atheist group which i am also a part of because they kind of spreading their footprint a little bit i had spoken to him and he said that india as far as being atheist is concerned is very tolerant mm. at least most hindus don't really mind if you're an atheist so mm. the things that we hear about that that have happened in the us where people have been fired people yeah. have lost their families for coming out as an atheist i wanted to get your perspective on how that is you've spoken to so many people and in your own life have you felt any sort of discrimination or any stigmatization against atheism or you per se no in my personal life i have not because as i said my my immediate family is quite chill mm -hmm. but i think the reason some countries tend to have a more the outcome of being an atheist tends to be more serious in some countries you have to look at it from the perspective of what that country what religion means in that country and what they value so here's something i'll tell you if it is a simple matter of not believing in god then abrahamic religions are going to be harsher on it because believing in god is a very vital thing there yeah in india not believing in god alone will not bring harsh punishments but rejecting a guru or the caste system will bring harsh punishments upper caste hindu children can afford to tell their parents that i am i don't believe in god and their parents will be like yeah, yeah, eat your food and go do your homework <laughs> but the day they say that the guru that the family believes in or the deity that the family believes in was a liar or a cheat that day there will be serious consequences or the day they say that our family is someone that belongs to an oppressor caste that day it will be harsher consequences we have seen inter caste marriages being punished all over india by death by families in fact we yeah, yeah. honor killing apparently that's what it is called it should be called dishonor killing so the foundation of a religion abroad might be god in india it is not and that is why i think that the simple act of not believing in the existence of god is okay in most hindu households unless you are someone who goes after like these days it's even more complicated because we have brought god back into the equation with a vengeance like modern day hindutva is very god focused it's very deity focused and regardless of what someone slightly chiller might say online yeah no we don't believe in god i find that there are two distinct categories of people who talk about hinduism one is talking about hinduism to white people mm -hmm. so that version of hinduism will be all chill spiritual calm no punishment no hell and everything and white people are like oh wow this is not at all like my religion mm -hmm. and then there is another kind about which people will not talk they will not recommend those books and these will be books about caste these will be books about the oppressive practices in the religion these will be books by ambedkar etc i think a key part of being an indian atheist if you truly want to understand what an atheist feels like in pakistan or in america will be to see how opposed someone is to the caste system because at the end of the day it still comes from the doctrine of karma right? people get their caste from their births and they are born into whatever conditions they are born into because of the actions that they performed in the past life so that is our god what the position god holds in an abrahamic society caste holds in our society so atheism alone might be not very might not be punished but that will be so that is my position on that ah very interesting and this and the concept of karma is something that karma sorry yeah karma anyway. <laughs> if you think karma you're like westernized and all that <laughs> yeah so karma karma uh, so i have a lot of very serious problems with that very concept but i want to let you have a go at it before i tell everyone what my perspective is my general perspective on the matter is that what are we exactly doing when we believe in god we are ascribing consciousness and agency to the universe yeah or a creator of the universe but you might as well call it the universe because if someone is going to justify the existence of god by saying the universe must have a creator then you can say god must have a creator and then you're stuck with the same problem so might as well remove the middleman and make it the universe uh, these days a lot of western 
commentators of the religious variety also would say that you this love universe is god and all that so what we are doing when we believe in god or saying that god does things is that we are saying there is a cosmic intelligence that concerns itself with the affairs of humans who are one species on one planet and one corner of one galaxy right now there is a personal aspect to it there is compassion there is care there is listening to prayers and all that but even if you take all of that away you are left with karma which is impersonal but it is still a principle of the universe according to religious people who believe in it that has some kind of interest in human affairs it concerns itself with goodness and badness it concerns itself with actions and their consequences and it is not universal because it does not apply to animals it applies to human beings so at the end of the day karma is god you just remove the face and the name and the beard and the clothes but at in at its core it is still ascribing some kind of moral quality to the universe and therefore it can be rejected on the same grounds as we reject god yeah very true i didn't have never looked at it that way but i've looked at it more from the perspective of even if you just take it as its essence of good deeds and bad deeds and even a lot of hindus friends of mine who have spoken to it, basically that whatever goes around comes around which is the basic concept of it if you do bad you will get bad and anyway, if yeah. you don't if you do good you will get fortune and fame and whatever at least happiness in your life and good luck on the whole and essentially my problem is that is always seen from a very narrow perspective of the here and now and like if somebody whacks your wallet or like a girlfriend breaks up with you with a in a very nasty way then like she's going to get what she's what's got what she's got come in or even from the male perspective that he's mm. at what's coming to him it'll bite him in the ass later but when you stretch it out a little bit at least from my perspective does that mean that people who have really horrible circumstances right now did something really bad in the past life that's almost yeah. judging a person without knowing them saying that street kids or beggar children or something of that sort and they have probably the worst circumstances under which anyone can live yeah and that is essentially passing judgment on what they did in a past life that maybe they had absolutely no responsibility yeah, it's a, generally speaking it reduces empathy absolutely it yeah. just disconnects people from other people it just i find that extremely problematic and of course that. like that's the social aspect of it and it is used to justify caste violence and stuff i am a huge critic of this hustle culture thing that is happening right now mm -hmm. people say that if you work hard you will get what you want and they ignore all the other aspects all the other factors that go into making someone successful which is parental wealth and all so in america also you will see people saying the poor are poor because they are lazy and the rich are rich because they are working hard so there's this deification of hard work which yeah. is counter to everything we know about so how society works and this is it's almost religious in nature right mm -hmm. because it discounts every other factor it discounts the fact that you have privilege it discounts the fact that the other person who is poor does not have access to the resources that you have the reason they are not articulate in english is because they did not have the opportunity to study english or to live in environments where english was spoken quite mm. fluently by your parents spoke english or neighbors spoke english you were encouraged to pursue english you were brought books etc people mm. forget all of this so all of these factors go into the making of something and then at the end of the day you have something and someone else does not have something and you simply say eh, it's karma i am so nice <laughs> that i deserved all this and there are clearly people who did something bad in the last life we all know good people who did not get good things mm. and bad people who got good things and the only way you can rationally justify it is by saying reincarnation exists and there is no evidence of that either yeah no that's a good point and I, I, there's something else which i had spoken to kumar about yesterday was do atheists think religious people are stupid they shouldn't actually i don't because and i have complained about this also i've said that atheists should avoid doing this shit because it does not help at all the moment you call someone stupid a how do you know they're stupid i've seen a 17 year old edgy teenager who only makes atheist memes talk about a quantum physicist who's religious clearly there is a difference in intelligence and you're not smarter than him not believing in god has nothing to do with intelligence you Absolutely. can not believe in god and still be a dumb fuck and you can believe in god and still be very wise on matters on the individual issues this is why like i i do this live stream like where people come in and talk my approach to it is always to try to understand where people are coming from okay someone says 
I believe in God, I will say, okay, give me your definition of God. We can talk about that. Because mm. when you're making YouTube videos, you're making, you're responding to some unstated thing in the air. Mm. It's a nominal definition of God, like what everyone understands to be God. Yeah. I try to avoid doing that. And that is why I actually do a live stream because every person is different. Every person has a reason for thinking what they think. And we should not be so dismissive that, haha, you believe in God, therefore you're stupid. I oppose that to a great degree. Yeah. I know a lot of people who are extremely intelligent, perfectly good human beings, have an exceptional perspective on things and are generally good people. But they hold a lot of contradictory or supernatural belief systems, not just pertaining to God, but maybe astrology, numerology, etc., yeah. which, which of course have absolutely no basis in science, which maybe some of our viewers might not agree with us on that one. But yeah, so it, it doesn't take intelligence to believe in something which is superstitious or religious. It just, it is something that we have been almost brainwashed or conditioned to believe since we were children. And since everybody in our society does believe in it, it provides a sense of community. It brings yeah. people together. And like these tropes, we don't know everything in the universe. Therefore, they, there's probably a God or might as well live life as, as, as if God. one exists. And that is... That's definitely, it's not a factor that really counts in too much. But going on to a little bit more specificity in your journey, when did the whole Vimo channel start? When did you start podcasting? How, what brought that idea to you? Oh, Vimo actually did not start as an atheist channel. My name on social media is Vimo. I just started a YouTube channel. I had no idea what I wanted to do there. The first few videos, if you watch them, were just shot on my phone. The audio is really bad. And the idea was to talk about society and storytelling. And I had hoped that at, in some way it will bleed into atheism also because the religions are stories. So I was hoping to get to it somewhat tangentially. I was trying to create an awareness of stories as the foundation of society and how a lot of things that we consider objectively true about religion are actually also just stories. Mm -hmm. So the first three videos you'll find, I'm talking about Green Lantern and the Netflix series and uh, something or the other. The thrust was always the same. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, as usually happens when a YouTube channel starts, people are wondering, why are people not watching? And then I realized maybe I was being too smart. So I started making short explainer videos and stuff. And even that, that didn't work for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of the political upheavals of early 2020 and late 2019, when Jamia was attacked and everything, he started writing Twitter threads and posting screenshots of them on Instagram. Ah, And it really worked. It shot up. My subscriber base went from, on Instagram, went from 600. Right now it is at 36,000 something. So it really shot up and I figured that, hey, I can actually use this as the place to do the things that I wanted to do on YouTube. So I started putting those short videos on Instagram and they got some traction. Eventually I asked people, hey guys, you would you like me to do an Instagram live every day? And they said, yeah, so I did. And we talk about atheism and politics and social justice and everything. And of course, Instagram is notoriously unmonetizable for people who are not posting soft porn. So at some point, I figured I have a YouTube channel. It didn't work. Maybe I can take these people to YouTube. Mm -hmm. I tried for a long time. I tried to do live streams on YouTube. I would do simultaneous live streams. I'll be live streaming on Instagram. Say, hey guys, if you want to come on YouTube, you can. So through that, a few people came and in due course of time, I stopped Instagram because the interface was really hard to work with. I would answer comments, right? So the yeah. comments, you can't scroll and hold the phone properly. And there was a weird sound when your hand touched the screen because of yeah. the static and all that. So I figured I'll just invest in some good equipment like this mic and a good webcam and do it on YouTube. So yes. I moved to YouTube. I had a podcast that I was updating infrequently. At some point of time in the last two years, I decided I can just unite the two. I'll take the audio from my live streams and I'll put it on my podcast. So now it's all uniform. It's like I do the show as a podcast, I take callers, and at the end of it, I take the audio and put it upon the podcast. So that is what has been happening. Very nice. I think that's a, I might actually steal that idea from you. <laughs> it's like blundering in the dark. I, I keep an eye on how the media landscape is working, right? I keep my eyes on the things that might change in the next five years. And I always have a backup plan. Right now I have four channels. One of them is a writing related channel. I oh. don't know what will happen to it, but maybe something will happen to it. In the middle for some time, I started a Hindi atheism podcast, but I could not keep up with it. So that kind of fell by the wayside. My towards content creation is that I'll also, I'll always be trying 10 ideas. Mm -hmm. Maybe two will work. 
and the other nine will die and that has been happening i have more dead projects than i have alive projects <laughs> it's evolution basically exactly that is exactly that was exactly what i was about to say that is what evolution is you have yeah. good mutations you have bad mutations and you end up with ones that succeed the ones that work yeah, <laughs> yeah. and success is defined by how much how much something can help me sustain myself indeed and yeah. having spoken to so many people and i'm sure a lot of atheists and what is colloquially known as the agnostic who is on the fence have you met atheists who are relatively unaware uninitiated into thinking skeptically thinking rationally or critically rather on the whole it seems harder right you you can either be someone who's an apatheist to use a loose term who doesn't care and there yeah. are plenty of people like that they don't believe and they don't care to talk about it either i don't believe man what's your problem why are you trying to tell me that i should believe go away yeah. so that is one category of people i find very few of those those people who are atheists who actually grew up in religious households and they have some reason for believing what they believe and most of it has to do with childhood nostalgia the conclusion i have come to after watching a lot of people is that here's the sequence of events you are born in a religious house you love your religion because you don't know any better you get to a point where you are smarter and you think hey, none of this makes any sense but you also don't want to let go of the sweet feelings of childhood festivals cousins parents dada dadi naye kapde kharid ke dete the wo sab so that happens so at that point of time in order to reconcile your understanding of the real world mm. and to maintain your religion you get into a phase which is something i would like to call justification phase mm. so you you find books which say yeah sure it's just superstition but quantum reality Uh, so that justification phase usually turns people spiritual which mm. means that they will continue to be religious but they will not call themselves religious they yeah. will call themselves spiritual or i consider myself a physicist i got some guy a couple of days ago who was not a physicist but he considered himself a physicist let's see <laughs> that phase happens <laughs> and then maybe if they expose themselves to enough skeptical thought some of them break away from it say it doesn't make sense my childhood is too far behind me I have lived half my life in ignorance or at least believing the wrong things. Mm-hmm. I don't have to spend the remaining life believing the same shit. And maybe there is reason around to see that religion is doing some tangible damage to human society, to democracy, to rights, to human rights. Maybe Absolutely. it is time I just broke away from it. Maybe I just call call it for what it is. Yeah. The fa- it's a funnel, the funnel thing, marketing funnels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a funnel thing. The number of atheists who come out at the end of it is very small. But everyone goes through it. Exactly, except for somebody like me who never had really had yeah i think on the whole very people rare. like you are rarer exactly we're very rare yeah i have always had this problem with really educating myself about indian religions because such a vast amount yeah of material out there is based on on christian world views and on now becoming more frequently muslim world views yeah where a lot of ex muslims are making mm. content to yeah. educate people about the the problems with the religion but it's very rare to find an equivalent for hinduism which anyways hinduism is very hard to find so i'd love to hear how you would define it yeah, i run into the same problem and i have seen western atheists struggle with this so much that when i started doing this i figured that i really need to come up with a way to actually deal with this because hinduism tends to be slippery exactly right? you cannot come to any single conclusion about it you talk to a person and you say hey this belief is wrong and he'll say i don't believe in it and he will have 10 other beliefs which you hadn't heard of till now right? yeah exactly so the main reason i do the live stream is because i cannot deal with this stuff by making youtube videos about okay so today we are going to debunk hinduism it cannot be done you cannot have 10 reasons hinduism is false because there will be 20 people who say i don't agree with any of these 10 reasons and here are 25 more reasons that you need to debunk you will be spending your lifetime doing it <laughs> so what i do is just whoever channel. comes i ask them what do you believe and why mm. and i start there then there is no scope for ambiguity because it's a direct face to face conversation so but- even if it's a hindu who has incorporated a little bit of abrahamic thought into it even if it's a christian who believes that he's actually hindu even if it's someone who says i have no religion but the universe is conscious i just start there okay that is a belief let's go step by step through it i but, think that is the best way to do it yeah, that's a that's a very good strategy definitely but is hinduism a religion from your perspective i it's too big a question and i give a simple answer saying if i pick up a government form in the list of religions as hinduism mentioned if it is then it's a religion oh that's, that's your philosophical true. sophistication <laughs> can go if itself if it's a religion according to a like if i go out and ask someone hey what's your religion they say hindu would say ah but what do you mean by religion is it advaita vedanta is it charvak school is it 
nirishwarwad nobody does that as far as normal people and normal conversations are concerned it's a religion and that's what i go by if someone wants to talk about the nuances of it i'm happy to do but come on my live stream and do it ah uh, because i i'm honestly i have met people who have basically said hinduism isn't the religion those it, are diversions it, those are diversions I, designed no. for uh, a western audience no but I, that's fine but i'm talking about my own friends who i'm like yeah hinduism yeah, but is, you and i will also count as westernized right yeah relatively yes definitely yeah. Urban Western sort of, yeah, yeah. So they said it's a life philosophy. I'm like, listen, you have certain supernatural beings that most people believe in who represent the part of Hinduism that they have, and they spend a significant amount of their time and money investing in praying to those supernatural beings and asking them for things that you just like you would for any god. <laughs> There are many gods. Mm -hmm. There are places where those gods are worshipped. Mm -hmm. There are forms in which those gods are worshipped, and that's what makes it a religion. But it is very slippery. I'll give you that. It's yeah, it's been that slippery. I think several layers of oil are applied on it on an everyday basis. Well, it's not naturally slippery. It is maintained as slippery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which makes it very hard to define and very hard to refute in very specific terms. In general terms, yeah, it is hard to refute. in general terms i suppose any religion will be hard to refute but it is easier when it is abrahamic because there are some foundations to it god exists there is yeah. a prophet or a son of god and if you don't believe in them your claim to that religion is significantly reduced exactly. you can have like islam has the ahmadiyya sect or shia and sunnis are there christianity has broken up so many times there are like uncountable numbers of churches just across america forget the world exactly. and hinduism is the same but there are fewer foundational claims in hinduism and script and scriptures yeah yes. that's true there is an attempt to make the bhagavad gita and some into some kind of central scripture but that is also not true because there are many hindus who will completely reject the bhagavad gita and still continue to call themselves hindu yeah and there are so many of these there's the bhagavad gita there the upanishads there the vedas which is which a lot of people say that is the center of hinduism but it's most of them have not read them exactly and <laughs> he's going to sit through and read every single word of those things no i'm saying even the people who propose uh, these books are the foundations yeah. of the religion have not read them the other day on my live stream by the way it's a funny incident the other day on my live stream somebody came and said the bhagavad gita mentions the stratosphere and the layers of the atmosphere how do you answer that i said okay where did you find this out he sent me a graphic and the graphic says the krishna krishna says this chapter and verse i said okay let's open the chapter and verse chapter and verse was not about that do something else entirely and i said do you think this mentions the atmospheric levels he said no okay bye <laughs> there are ran there is random stuff floating around where people are uh -huh. talking about quantum physics and atmosphere and any time science finds something there is a small cottage industry which starts making memes oh. and assigning random chapter and verse to bhagavad gita and yeah. it's not even there but how does one like for example you take me i haven't read any of the religious texts i haven't even i haven't managed to get past genesis in the bible let alone mm -hmm. because that in itself is so densely nonsensical that it just it boggled my mind i was like dude i can't do this right now but for people for atheists among us who want to educate themselves more and become more knowledgeable on the hindu religion what can they look for what are the books they can read what are the websites they can go to what would you recommend i don't know what i can recommend but i do think that it is important to study my advice would be to whatever extent it is possible for you to engage with a religion do to whatever extent it is possible to engage with people who want to tell you that the religion is true do but always do it on a case by case basis because you will you will still run into people who say the bhagavad gita is amazing and they have not read it or i sometimes like my favorite thing is i just ask people tell me who the father of the pandavas were and the common answer might be pandu but they had five like every single one of them came from a different father and yeah. all the fathers were gods <laughs> so if someone is unable to answer that basic question i sees conversation i said you need to learn more about your own religion before you can teach me to follow it because i have run a youtube channel for 2 years which has devoted to mythology i have written a comic book series which is based on hindu mythology i need to understand that we are on the same level as far as knowledge of all this is concerned before i can start conversing but i would recommend a book by ambedkar called riddles in hinduism in fact at some point i think i should make a book list for indian atheist i have tried to do it in a broken way many times there is a book by meghnath desai called who wrote the bhagavad gita I would encourage people to make a clear distinction between books written by Hindus for white people and books written by people who have been on the oppressed side within Hinduism about Hinduism. Those are the books we should go for. The books written by Dalit Bahujan Adivasi authors about Hinduism are the places where Indian atheists should start as far as reading about religion is concerned. 
Mm-hmm. And of course, I would also recommend that you people read the Quran, the Bible, and the Bhagavad Gita because these get thrown around the most. Like some time ago, there was this proposal, right? Should there be a religious study class in schools? I think there should be. But as long as it is taught like a religious study class, and people don't start using it for preaching, it should be taught by religious scholars. It should be taught by people who are scholars of comparative religion. not priests from any religion because exactly. that will just mess it up and you need to teach every religion separately and and equally given equal weightage to everything yeah. i mean we have had comparative religious studies uh, as courses in universities for quite some time maybe a school version of it can be prepared if that is what is done i am totally in favor of it because somebody was asking me some time ago how do you bring up an atheist child and my answer was i wouldn't why would i bring up a child an atheist i would bring up the child as a human being whatever they choose to believe is up to them my duty as a parent would be to expose them to all kinds of thoughts so i would tell them about hinduism christianity islam but also that there are people who don't believe in any of it most Absolutely. people become prisoners of their religion because they are not exposed to anything else and that is what you should fight we should expose them to more things and most people will make their own decisions absolutely and as so many skeptics and atheists personalities in the us have said you have to teach people not what to think but yeah, how but how to think exactly and in fact for a, for quite a long time my youtube channel banner just had those words how to think ah that's nice i honestly i had, did consider that as one of the logos as yeah. one of the models <laughs> for <laughs> rationable as well because i honestly i i feel that the teaching of critical thinking and comparative religion and the openness to different cultures those kind of values should be taught starting from school from preschool even from in very basic forms just to educate people but i think that uh, the powers that be which are governmental and educational institutions i think would be very resistant towards of towards oh absolutely there will be because this is why the internet matters so much exactly so here we are <laughs> we're doing yeah. scan yeah. on the internet to educate as many people as we can you've been doing this for the last couple of years yeah you think you've made a dent have you changed any minds yet if by any minds you mean more than one then yes ah nice a lot of people who come on my live stream are actually not atheists they are religious people who find some merit in the way i talk about religion so they come and i would like to think that i'm making small dents all over the place it is never it is almost never possible to have a conversation with a religious person and the conversation ends and they give up their religion like my goal with whenever i talk to people is that this is a conversation starter mm-hmm. this is where we are i understand your point of view i hope you understand mine come back and if they find the experience stimulating enough they will come back and in four or five meetings maybe they'll start thinking something but and if they don't that's still okay because the content of our conversation is online and other people can watch it and maybe they will think something yeah i've noticed that your the way you converse with your callers it has a kind of a socratic quality to it so you have the socratic method otherwise known as street epistemology or just epistemology and the way yeah. that he has been promoted by anthony Mag- magnabosco magnabosco yeah i'm a huge fan of his work and i try to base my approach to conversations on his i actually recently got the book that he was inspired by which is a manual for creating atheists yeah i've read that <laughs> yeah so i'm reading that right now and i'm trying to sharpen my methods or not sharpen because that sounds rude i'm trying to make my method more effective mm. because usually it just becomes i recommend that you read this book acha i recommend that you read that book the <laughs> authors of those books are having a proxy discussion through us we are not talking to each other exactly. whenever someone sends me a link in fact i have banned links on my youtube comments mm. if you want to make an argument you are going to have to use your own words because it's very easy to throw a link at someone it's very easy to you go read these five books yeah like he's going to <laughs> nobody is going to do it they're going to throw the books at yeah. him and feel smug and he's going to ignore you completely and no no gain is going to be made talk Absolutely. to each other that's my point actually this have to have the conversations yeah but uh, as a recommendation <laughs> recommend the book book well, timing by the way <laughs> exactly so peter <laughs> bogosian who wrote a man uh, creating atheists has made a sequel is much less controversial because it's not just about a manual for creating atheists it's called how to have impossible conversations if That's, i uh, Ma- anthony magnum bosco i think at some point in an interview i remember maybe it was same or someone else he said this book should not have been called how to create an atheist be called how to create doubt yeah. i found the book the name of the book was very objectionable but he did still read it but i yeah. find the 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 sequel that he's done a much better job of clarifying and it's not just about atheism he's talking about any kind of conversation yeah. it can be political it can be 
about just basic beliefs about ghosts or I'll you... definitely get my hands on this book yeah, because yeah. that's the Look. first thing that I noted was that the book is black and on it says in red how to create an it sounds like that book that the scarlet which is holding in the MCU <laughs> like yeah. ah, ha, 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 I shall now create an atheist the that dark. sort of thing is happening the dark hole yeah. like the book that if religious people touch it they burst into flames or something it's not very helpful absolutely there's one last topic that I really wanted to touch on with you and get your perspective on now this is some this is a conversation that my father and I have had this times and mm -hmm. we never managed to really agree on it now the uh, so what keeps happening is that somebody write something controversial about Islam. They get a fatwa put on them and people try to kill him. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they succeed. Yeah. So this happened... Salman Rushdie most no notably. They didn't succeed, but he was attacked quite significantly. Absolutely. Yeah. And I actually went to see him and Richard Dawkins in 2012 at the Jaipur Literary Festival and didn't come because he wasn't allowed to enter the country. And, uh, Richard Dawkins did manage to because he's never said anything controversial against Islam's or uh, Islamic religion. Or He has, but not Islam. to the extent. Like, I not think Salman Rushdie's reputation with respect to that book from that long ago yeah. works to his disadvantage in this respect. But Richard Dawkins gets away because he has said many small things. Yeah. And Salman Rushdie is thought of as the person who wrote an entire book. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Poor guy. But so the thing is, my father's position is he he feels that you should not provoke such people by writing material that will lead to violence or will mm. lead to some sort of retaliation. While my position is when it comes to freedom of speech, you have a right to I personally wouldn't do that myself. I wouldn't draw Muhammad or something like that just for kicks. But at the same time. One has the right to express themselves and to criticize ideas and to ridicule really bad Absolutely, ideas. Absolutely, they do. And it depends on the country you live in. If you're in a country where you have blasphemy laws, where you're not allowed to do that, you will get your head chopped, chopped off if you say mm. it or executed in some form. Yeah. Absolutely, to protect yourself, you shouldn't. But what is your perspective on communicating ideas that ridicule religion and which may lead to controversy and may lead to retaliation, but you have the right to do it. It comes down to approaches, right? First of all, just to be on the, on extremely clear about this, it is not okay to kill people for criticizing religion, regardless of which religion it is, which prophet it is, which deity it is. It's not cool. People have also been killed for criticizing Hindu deities. Absolutely. But that's beside the point because you're talking about Islam and I don't want to deflect it into something else. I think that if the goal is communication, we have to think about, I am having conversation with someone who's Muslim. No, I'm not specific. I'm, I'm saying sorry? any religion because Islam is, of course, most in the news for this. Yeah. No, I think it is important to talk about Islam from the point of view of this because power structures come into it. There is a difference between insulting Islam in Saudi Arabia and yeah. insulting Islam in India. In both cases, it's okay to insult Islam, I think. But I also think that we need to be mindful of what the repercussions of our actions are going to be for other people. It's one thing for me to insult Islam and take responsibility for whatever happens. If I criticize Islam, in what ways am I contributing to the already existing anti-Muslim bigotry in India? Hmm. Because that is also a factor that needs to be taken into consideration. Absolutely. Now, I can be irresponsible about it. I say, I don't care. Free speech, I'll say whatever I want. I don't care who dies. I don't care who's hurt. That's one thing. And hmm. I think I would be a dick if I did that. Secondly, if I'm talking to a Muslim person who's extremely emotional about his religion, I think the Socratic method works better than to just anger him. Exactly. Right? If, I, if my goal is to just piss him off, if my goal is to just insult him and feel good about it, just to vent, then sure, that can be very easily achieved. But what is harder is actually talking to him, trying to find the foundations of his religion. I know there are really brave people in Pakistan who are secular activists, mm -hmm. who are atheist YouTubers. There is Haris Sultan and Ghalib Kamal and all. And they criticize Islam on a daily basis. They provide constructive criticism. They talk to people the same way that I do. And they are risking a lot. Absolutely. It is very easy for an Indian atheist to form a YouTube channel and criticize Islam because they will get support from all kinds of quarters. They will also put themselves at risk, by the way. I'm not a huge fan of BJP and not a huge fan of Nupur Sharma, the BJP spokesperson who said something about Islam on TV and got death threats. It should not happen to her. It should not happen to anyone. Right? But we also need to keep in mind that the person who said this belongs to a party which has recently, why recently, forever, been at the forefront of spreading anti-Muslim bigotry. And because of that, a lot of people have also suffered. 
So our criticism of a religion needs to be tempered by an awareness of social realities that exist in the society that we live in, which is the bigger problem. Which problem am I solving by doing this? What problems am I creating by doing this? Yeah. Absolutely. That's very well put. Okay. So now for people who have just been introduced to you, where can they find you? Where, where can they get in touch? How they, can they get onto your calls? My YouTube live stream, it's at youtube.com slash at Vimo Live. And my YouTube channel where I mostly post shorts and occasionally a video is youtube.com slash Vimo. So slash Vimo and slash Vimo Live are the two YouTube things I have. You can come subscribe to either of them and we'll talk. On YouTube, I go live on Wednesdays at 9.30 p.m. and Saturdays at 9.30 p.m. It usually happens for one and one and a half hours or two hours at max, but we take callers. People call in, we just talk about what they believe in and it's these are chill conversations. Occasionally, some fun emerges from it, but yeah. mostly it's interesting. As That's what I've been told. And if you want to listen to the audio transcripts of these, you can just find Vimo Live on Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Ghana.com, any audio platform and search for Vimo Live, V-I-M-O-H-L-I-V-E and the podcast subscribe to the podcast or listen to it. Wonderful. Are you also on any social media like Twitter still? And Yeah, I'm on Instagram, but I got a threat last week that my account may be deleted because I used the word Brahminism because oh. apparently that's hate speech. So wow. no, it's not hate speech, but Instagram is hand in glove with certain nefarious people <laughs> in power. So we shall drop it. If you want to, you can follow me on Instagram. I post shorts there also, reels rather. Ah, uh, cool. My handle is Vimo, V-I-M-O-H. And the same on Twitter. Wonderful. Yeah. In fact, I don't even join any web service if I can't get the username Vimo. <laughs> That's good. That's a good way to do it. I have, unfortunately, I have compromised multiple times. <laughs> I'm irrational in most places because apparently there's another rational out there. I don't know who wow. it is. But it's very heartbreaking. You come up with a brilliant name. I'm sure nobody has it. And then turns out 20 people have it. Exactly. And rationable.com, I was searching for that all over the place. Apparently, it's not available and it's for sale for some few thousand dollars. Yeah, I made that Somebody mistake. Left. I had Vimo.com. I uh, let it go because I was not getting any traffic and now it costs a few lakhs. So I have Vimo.in where my podcast website is www.vimo.in. Thank you so much, Vimo, for being on Rational. It's been an amazing conversation. I'm sure we'll have many more. Thanks, discuss. Abhijit. See you on your podcasts and uh, I'll... Catch you later. Thanks everyone for joining in. Thanks for uh, thanks for watching this video. If you want to find out more, if you want to listen to the podcast, you can go to berationable.com and you can subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting service. And thanks, Avijit. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. See ya.